everybody, and welcome. Uh, we, uh, as always, starting to have some people join in, so we all know the deal. It takes a little bit of time for people to start to uh, uh, to join in, so we're going to spend a, a minute or two while everybody is coming on board. Uh, interesting enough, I see some familiar names here, so it's always good to see uh, uh, some old friends as we start. And we're going to get started in a minute or so, but uh, welcome. Uh, before we get started, so Michael, you're in uh, you're in Denver right now. Yep, in Denver, Colorado. Yeah. So, is it cold? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Especially from me, I'm, I'm I'm used to I'm used to the Australian summer, so it's it's pretty chilly. Yeah. So yeah, no worries. Actually, I can imagine it would be uh, a little bit. Um, and and the office is in your your main office in in Australia is in uh, in Melbourne, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it never really gets hot there, does it? No, in Melbourne it gets hot. It doesn't really get cold. Oh, okay. Well, what so, do you consider hot? Because I live in Florida. Okay. So hot. I uh, I'm going Celsius. I don't know the conversion. Yeah, it's okay. But like it would occasionally hit like forties, forty degrees really? Celsius. Really? Yeah. Most. Like the other, like I think yesterday my partner was telling me it was 37 or 38. So summer, summer is hot. It just oh. doesn't get cold. There's no, there's no snow. There's no, I think out, like oh, even overnight during winter, it will bottom out at like five or five degrees Celsius. Okay. Well, I know when I was there visiting um, in, uh, I guess it was March, it rained the entire time. So anyway. Yeah. yeah um, Melbourne goes from, um, you know, sunny in the morning to raining by lunch. So that's that's pretty yeah. that's pretty typical. No worries. All right. So, um, and uh, hi, Jose. Good to see you too. We're getting little chat messages. So all good. All right. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we get started? Uh, Michael's going to share his screen. So he's going to be driving today, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna get going. All right. And so, no stress. Let me share my screen. Perfect. All right. So, uh, so again, welcome everybody. We're 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 happy to have everybody here. Um, the uh, the topic today is uh, personalized user experiences that convert. Now, obviously, we're big into conversions, all right? But let's talk a little bit about you know the two of us for a second. So, um, I'm Marty Greif, all right, and I'm president of Site Tuners. Uh, a, a number of you uh, know who I am because I'm getting little messages. Um, and uh, just a, a brief note about site tuners. Um, we're basically a conversion rate optimization agency, and it's all about aligning that customer um, uh, intent with the experience and your goals. And that is all I'm going to say about site tuners because today is is really going to be mostly the Michael show. So um, Michael Tutek is the co-founder and CEO of uh, Prezi. And I want to talk a little bit about Prezi. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of time on this slide here. All right. Um, so they've been around for about five years now, really started doing serious commercialization in about four years. Uh, we have worked with them on a number of clients. We've introduced them uh, into clients, and we have seen some astonishingly great results from that, which is why we have a webinar and promoting this and showing people um, a little bit about uh, about Prezi. Now, um, they've won some awards uh, in Australia and they're expanding big time now into the United States. They've actually opened a US office in Denver. Um, now, Michael uh, is, is still staying in, um, in, uh, in Australia, but he, you know, he's coming back and forth. Uh, but having said that, uh, one of the partners, uh, Kwok, is uh, is has moved his family here and you've hired some people here so we're expecting major 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 results now in in the US and so um i would like just to share with you, with everybody on here um this is a technology that we recommend to people uh, we don't get anything out of it okay other than happy clients and so uh i'm going to turn this over uh, to michael and I will tell you, working with Michael and the team has been nothing short of a pleasure. So 
Michael, I don't know if you want to add anything to any of this or if you just want to go for it, my friend. Uh, thanks, Marty. I think you're too kind. No, I mean, I appreciate it. It's been it's been great. And I can echo I can echo the the reverse, Marty. You know, a few people we work with that that obviously do work with site tuners and the team have said nothing but excellent things. So now I appreciate you taking the time and um setting everything up and, and promoting it. So excited to share what we're talking about, in particular, very relevant, given what's happening with Google and Apple. So yeah, keen to get stuck in. Absolutely. Let's go for it. Okay. Oh, um, I, let me do, I will add one thing. If you have questions, folks, just put them in the Q&A and, you know, uh, I, I may interrupt Michael in the process to get your question asked or maybe towards the end, but, yeah. uh, but it's, it's all good. All right. No worries. Yep. Hey, yeah, ask as uh, ask as we go. We'd like to keep it relatively casual. So, um, today's you know general theme is what we're calling personalized personalizing zero party experiences that 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 convert. So very quickly, won't go into um, too much detail, but the things that we'd like to cover is you know a little bit more on zero party versus first party, but with specific examples. I think even you know experts I speak to. Often when they go, you know, what is zero party? What is first party? What is third party? It, it does get confusing. There's no doubt about it. So, you know, we'll cover that in, in, um, in some detail. And then we'll go into like, why does it actually matter? Because ultimately what happens is, you know, a lot of brands and Marty, you'd know this better than most. There's just a ton of different tools. There are a ton of different ways to optimize. There is, you know, redesign, replatform a thousand widgets. So I think part of it is like, how do you actually figure out what you should spend your time on, but also short term and long term, you know, lifetime value versus an immediate conversion. Um, moving on, we'll talk about, you know, the importance of zero party personalization, how we actually build the experiences. We'll talk about a few customers we're working with. Um, and then we'll, we'll, you know, conveniently end it with um, checkout and post checkout experiences that we're seeing um, coming up a lot now, especially with like the rise of things like retail media um, and a lot of budget actually going to retailers to market products. So that's a, a little bit of a um, agenda on what we would like to cover today. Perfect. Right. So yeah. let's, let's dig into um, zero party and first party. So these terms often get um, thrown around as if they're the same thing. Now, they they relate, obviously, but they're, they're actually different. So we'll talk about first party because that's what most people are, generally speaking, more familiar with. So you can see there, first party is defined as information that you capture um, from a customer base or from people who hit your website when they interact with your content. So this is typically passive interaction. Um, it's not voluntary. So an example here is um, a session ID or a user ID or Kanya, you know, if she's logged in or you know who that person in, you know, clicked on dresses, spent seven minutes on the site, viewed five pages, three of which were dresses, two of which were bags. Now we can all agree that that is, you know, very powerful data. Um, but being first party, it is actually second to zero party. So in terms of data, you know, effectively zero, first, second, third, um, it just disconnects more. So the closer you are to zero, the better. And zero is, is the best form of data. So moving on to the left there, kind of to, to define zero party versus first party, it's data that a customer intentionally and proactively shares with the business. So if you look at first party, if I go on a website and I click a few buttons and I and I see some products, like I'm not actually expecting you to, like I'm not actually telling you anything. I'm just browsing and it's passively collecting that information. Versus on the example on the right, say Tanya goes onto your site, she fills in a quiz, and in that quiz you learn that she's 30 to 40 years old. She's looking for, say, above the knee dresses, She's interested in a matching bag. Um, it's for a wedding and it's this weekend. And with that, you know, she may send that email, send that um, those results or this information to her email. And therefore you've got an email, phone and name. So you can now really start to understand the difference 
in zero party versus first party in terms of what you're actually capturing? You know, another way to think about that, if you take it off the website for a second, you go to a party, you see somebody, you can, based on just their appearance, you can make some assumptions about them. But if you talk to them and they tell you a little about themselves, you're actually learning about them and the interaction becomes much more engaging. Yes, that, that's actually a, a that, that's a really good example. You know, how many times have we heard, um, you know, don't judge the book by its cover? You can almost look at first party is the cover, zero party is reading the book, um, and and it big and it plays a huge role in, in um, how you actually, you know, provide an experience um, post getting it if you can find a way to capture it. So moving on, I think it, it's probably fair to say there's probably some really clear advantages like why this matters, why should anyone care? Because you can personalize better, but Going into, into the specifics, we've been hearing about it for a while, but um, Google is actually cutting third-party cookies um, in January. So in Jan 24, next, next, literally next month, 1% of all Chrome browsers are actually going to get um, third-party cookies cut. And then their, their hope is by the end of the year, they won't have any third-party cookies running anymore. Now, obviously, this is a big deal. Like, Chrome looks after or represents, you know, 65% of all internet traffic. So we're talking, you know, 65% of your sessions are going to, you know, not have third-party cookies. Now, further to this, you can see, like, and, and most brands would be familiar with this, that Apple um, has been making a lot of changes with iOS. You know, iOS 17 and 15 made a lot of changes. So even now, in just normal like systems like Clavio, Dot Digital, Amasis, you'll get little warnings that say, you know, this open rate may not be, you know, accurate due to Apple's recent privacy changes. Mm -hmm. So the truth is, this is becoming super relevant. And you can see there on the right, just some general media, but the, the most interesting one is that screenshot on the bottom right is actually from Clavio, uh, effectively saying that you know, the future is going to be geared towards brands that actually capture zero party. And the more and more time you, you spend not capturing it, the less and less you know. It's effectively, Marty, back to your example, going into the party, looking at everybody, understanding what's going on, but not having a single conversation. So not knowing anything like tangible about anyone. Yeah. So let's let's dig into um, a little bit about you know how this all makes sense. Like we've articulated zero party and first party. We've gone through like why it matters. So let's talk about like how do we actually create experiences, and and let's talk about real life examples. So if we think of personalization, um, one of the best ways to think about it is actually looking in and considering how in store shopping experiences work. I think. You know, lots of lots of e-commerce managers and leaders are, are looking at how to increase conversion rates um, through you know technology, AI. Um, but a, a lot of the a lot of the stuff you can actually see by just looking into a store, walking into a store. You know, stores, physical stores, convert at you know 30, 40 percent. So the idea, um, in essence, is if you walk into a store and you speak to um, Jessica will speak to Tom and let's say you're looking for a barbecue or a TV Tom will start asking you questions and what is you know why are you buying a TV did your TV go are you building a home theater you know how big is the room and he or she will start learning all the things about you so you can see that if you consider an in-store experience there is obviously an intent and then there is an in-store and then there is a, a conversion or potentially a nurture for larger transactions. If you convert that to an online experience, the same thing happens. Um, there is an intent, there is a website visitor, and then there is a nurture. So a lot of this comes down to how do you actually identify all that information? Like in a physical store, to your example, Marty, um, you, can, you can speak to someone, you speak to them, you provide advice, you ask questions. But obviously online, that's not as natural but you can still get all that information and that all obviously pans into being zero or first party. So it's, you know, things like 
can you identify why the person hit your website? Can you identify that? If you can, that's like identifying their intent. So all of a sudden you're, you're changing the conversation from, hey, you need something and I've got some products that you can buy to let me actually understand why you're here. And then from there, you can look at things like, um, you know, um, are you looking for something specific? Is it for yourself? Is it for someone else? And then with all this, you identify an incredible amount of information that actually helps you get a sale. So in a physical store, you know, for example, if someone walked in and said, hey, I'm looking for a TV for a theater, I'm not starting the project until March because I've got to do a tax return, for example, then you know that that person's not buying and you can actually start to identify their barriers. And it builds a really, really amazing piece of thought logic. So the idea of this is the personalization can actually just stem from, you know, looking at what experiences look like in store and then adapting that for the online um, version. Yeah, if I were to add to that, just as a thought, we've all bought cars in the past and we've had really great experiences buying cars and really bad experience buying cars, right? And so you go in to buy the car and you got the salesperson just talking at you and not asking any questions whatsoever. They're just on and on and on. Versus you go into a, a dealership and the car salesman says, so what brings you in today? You know, why now? They start to have a real conversation with you. And what you're doing is you're basically talking about having the website um, not be the used car salesman that's just pushy, but having that, that, that personal connection with people online. And that's the power. If it works, think about when you bought a car. Were you pushed or did you buy, right? People don't want to be sold. They want to buy. And that's what Michael's talking about. And Michael, if you disagree with that analogy, please feel free. But I feel like that's what you're telling us. Yeah, for sure. I think that there, are, there are lots of different examples. It's like right now, you know, typically e-commerce talks about product discovery. Yeah. And it talks about how do you discover product? And, you know, we do that and CRO will do part of that. But this is almost reversing it. This is like talking about um, application slash people discovery, user discovery. We all know when we're selling anything, whether it be software or car, one of the best ways best ways to actually close um, or actually get a product sold is to understand like why the person is buying, who are they buying for, what brought them here. And then you can actually adapt what you're saying to make sure that you focus on those points. Same thing. So I 100% agree, Marty. It's, it's a great analogy. Oh, and I just, and I'm taking notes on that one. People discovery. I wrote that down. I love that. Yeah. There you go. Maybe we should trademark it. We can share the royalties. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So I think something to, to mention moving on from that is um, don't be distracted effectively. And what, what I try and encourage is don't be distracted too much by the new and shiny. Um, and we can return to the basics. So if you think about it, you know, we are all, we're all human beings. We're all buying for ourselves, our loved ones. Um, we're all buying because we either desire something or need something. And it's very easy just kind of change the philosophy of the CX mantra from going, hey, rather than selling, let's service. Hmm. So a really good example of this, and I'll take it back to the, the TV example because I think it's, it's really easy to understand. If you walk into a Best Buy and you speak to Sally, and she finds out that you're, you know, building a home theater system and she recommends the right TV for your room because, you know, you need an 80 inch because the room is four meters long. So you need something really big um, and you need something that is relatively, say, reflection, um, um, can deal with reflections well because there are curtains that actually don't block out the, the, the sunlight. You can start to see Sally's learning, understanding there is a need, what it is it for, what is your application? And then Sally can recommend, hey, here is a TV. Now, let's assume you grab that TV, you go home, and you go to put it on the wall and you go, oh, like, like I don't have a wall bracket. Um, I wanted to run a cable through the roof. And you just forgot about these things. You got excited. You, you're not an ex expert 
in this all of a sudden your general experience of Sally would be like why like why would you not help me like why wouldn't you help me find a bracket why wouldn't you help me understand that I need, I need a cable that needs to go through my roof so if you flip that you go okay that was a poor experience but if you flip it back to Sally recommended TV and now because she knows you're building a theater she talks about hey is this a new theater or existing it's new okay you need a wall bracket you know how tall is your ceiling would you like a where are you going to mount it because if you mount it really low you don't need you don't need a bracket that tilts if you mount it higher you need a bracket that tilts so then all of a sudden you've got a wall bracket and then next it's hey um say she's serving you marty it goes on to um what are you doing in terms of cabling well I'm, i want to run you know um i need to run a let's say it's a projector i need to run a cable through the wall into the roof and back out to the top of the projector comes out of the roof okay how big is your room you know you can get this type of cable it can be a cat six it can be hdmi whatever it is um and you need 15 meters and all of a sudden you've now in the store lift the the aov which is only natural but that person gets home has everything they need and the overall experience is phenomenal they are extremely happy. They probably got a discount because the margins are better on accessories. And all of a sudden you leave, go home with a tremendously great taste in your mouth. So that's the difference from selling to servicing. Selling is cool. I know you need this TV, here you go. Servicing is understanding what they're using it for and giving them everything they need to achieve a goal, which is you know getting the theater all set up. And that's a, that's a great way to think about it, servicing versus selling, all right? Because one is focused on the, uh, on the visitor versus focused on what you need. Yeah, yeah. And, and in the end, if you think about most transactions, even on the screen, you'll see, you know, compression leggings. There's compression leggings, then there's shoes, then there's like the tops, Um and there's all kinds of things. Let's say, for example, in this in this example, you're um, you're starting to you've got a goal to run a marathon in six months' time, and you're not an expert. You're new to the game, so it helps you with your compression legging. But it says, hey, do you need top? Do you need a duffel bag? Do you need this? Do you need that? You're going to buy all those things anyway. You buy more from one place, get a better experience. They're all matched. Warranties all on the same day. They all come on the same time. You get a better price probably because you're selling, you're buying more. Like it is a win-win. So the higher you bring up these servicing, the higher your AOV is going to go, the better the customer actually feels. So when they spend more, they will feel better at the end of it. So this is, you know, going into a little bit more detail on that. So I guess part of part of this, you know, whole um, conversation we're having, Marty, is like it, it's all it's all good and well. But like, you know, in theory, it sounds very hard to achieve. You go, hey, on in store, that's easy. You've got human beings and um, they're intelligent and they understand applications and, and it's, it's easy. The thing is, it is relatively um, easy to achieve the same thing online. It's just we don't we don't typically consider it um, something that is like tangible or achievable. So, you know, in these examples, obviously, you, you go through product recommendations, which are pretty easy. But, you know, in this example here, you actually see um, this is a customer we have called Blue Bungalow. And this is an example where you've gone through a journey. We call them journeys, effectively the quizzes. You've asked the customer a bunch of questions about what they're looking for in a dress. And then at the end, it's actually saying, pick a dress and accessorize this. And this is actually off the back of a quiz. So we know that the person has asked for a, a bag, they're interested in bags, or they're interested in a, um, a necklace or both. So then what you can do is you can use the same information to accessorize. So say they wanted something that had earthy tones. Here is the earthy dresses, and then you get them a bag and a necklace that actually uses that same information. So tones are earthy um, and the vibe is earthy. So it's about taking that next step. Um, and you can do that relatively easily online because you, you saw in this one, this is a quiz. This is the online version of talking to the salesperson, ask you a bunch of questions and find your primary product. In this case, leggings, in this case, dresses. 
but then you can easily use the same information and same logic just like a real person would to find what those extra pieces are and then from there you can provide all kinds of incentive and really great um you know ways to capture the information send it to them via email and capture all that kind of zero party data and just to be clear when people go through these experiences the conversion rate goes up and so i'm just going to bring it back to why these people are here for a second we've seen people double triple quadruple their conversion rates from when people actually go through these experiences you know the range is nothing short of shocking at how much more it increases uh the conversions average order value and so on right and and michael you got a bunch of case studies that show these but we've seen it live with clients yeah i mean we've seen we've seen conversion rates like the highest we saw one was actually 10 times like the conversion rates were you know just short shy of one and we were we were just shy of 10. um and on average we see 50 to 300 percent increase on conversion rates when shoppers actually use um the these these tools so moving on to a little bit more details on on the how because i think you know more more and more of this is you know great in theory but the how kind of becomes more important as you dig into it so you know as we said you know earlier in the start you know not relying on passive or low intent data allows you to create you know um, a brand new way of thinking for your customers so you know if you think about passive and low intent that is good data it is first party but all of a sudden when you take it to you know getting the nitty-gritty to ask them the questions you build out this zero party data so everything we've spoken about um is, is zero party and you can do it it doesn't have to be through freezy or um quizzes or you know bundles but you can you can do it in other ways you can have surveys you can have questionnaires but the ultimate the ultimate key here is that you need to like, ask the questions you need to learn from you know people discovery as you as you said earlier marty um, understand what their intent is why they're there service them suggest and then with all that information you you take it beyond the session or beyond the transaction so you take it into retargeting and that's where like half the value is so for example i know that carla is searching for new makeup to complete a look for 30th in two weeks you know that simple information there is cool i know i know it's carla capture her email um, she's looking for a new makeup don't know what yet I can ask more it's for a 30th so I can probably it's not guaranteed but there is a high percentage chance she's between between 25 and 35 and it's in two weeks so I can make assumptions to go if I want to capture this um customer's um say share of wallet you know my order takes on average four days to ship so I've got you know one and a half weeks to transact with Carla otherwise she's shopped somewhere else so all of a sudden you can start to build timing into this and it just takes it to a whole new world where you you actually know that you know for example let's say you you actually sold she bought some makeup from you you could go hey had that makeup go in in the 30th birthday I mean imagine how how well the experience would be um you know how did the dress you know here you know how did the dress go for the for the wedding um, did you need anything else? Like you can just build this incredible level of one-to-one -one personalization from website to, to, to an actual individual person. So I think um, you know, it's probably worthwhile going into a case study. So Marty, Marty's familiar with Guitar Center, and I'm sure most people are. Um, you know, one of the largest music retailers in the country. And we specifically work with Guitar Center um, for one, one core reason. They have an outstanding in-store experience. Um, you go in, you can, you can get service, you can have a go, you can do whatever you need to, but they struggle very heavily on how do we actually create anything online that even comes remotely close to the online experience. Um, the, the best they had, to be honest, was a call center and you called the call center and you speak to someone or you do live chat and you speak to someone, but that's obviously hard. People don't want to talk. It's not scalable. So they um, ultimately, they were looking for um, 
ways to bring in-store shopping online. So we work with them to effectively build out an experience where they had like guitar finders, um, you know, um, drum finders, pedal finders, cable finders, you know, Christmas gift finder. Like at the moment, they actually run a, a Christmas gift finder. And the results, you know, effectively speak for themselves. Every brand who wants to do different things will look for different outcomes. But obviously being a music retailer, once you're in their funnel, you know, musos, they're loyal. So they stick and they keep buying. So their focus was all on new, new customers. And we found that new customers were spending 25% more um, revenue wise when they actually use this, you know, four in every five <clears throat> people um, that used the quiz went the whole way through it. So overall, the experiences are great. And now it's just about, you know, expanding it. Like they they expand to um, lead generation and things like in-store and um, using it for their call centers. And more engagement also gives you extra Google love because Google loves engagement these days. So if people are going through the quiz, they're spending more time on site, they're spending more time on site, they're seeing more pages, Google rewards engagement. Yeah. And by the way, you sell more. Yeah, it's a it's a bit of a win win, and also there is an element where there is an increase in lifetime value for customer. Like we we have actually done quite a lot of analysis where we measure the engagement of a shopper that uses Prezi versus doesn't use Prezi over an extended period of time, say four weeks, eight weeks, twelve weeks, and all their metrics are better. Um, and I'm talking things like they're more likely to come back through organic channels. So they're less likely to kick a, click an ad to come back. Um, theory is that you're more memorable because you've provided a better experience. The, the numbers just get better and better. So part C of this is actually getting into a little bit more nitty gritty in terms of the retargeting. So you can see here, um, obviously we've captured all this zero party data, but we haven't spoken about how do we actually build it into a record that we can use post checkout. So in this example, you've bought a, you bought, um, you've got on the swept website, you've told the, the site you need a TV for a theatre, et cetera, et cetera. But if you actually look to, you know, provide an incentive to capture a, a name, an email, a phone number, you can then tie all that data back together. And this is where, you know, half, you know, fifty percent of the value is. So on the right hand side, you actually see an example of a record like Carla Jane, and you know her birthday. Carla Jane was looking for uh, makeup for her eyes that were allergen free. So now we know Carla's age, we know her email, we know her name, we know she was looking for makeup that was for the eyes that are allergen free. This is what we recommended. Now all this data is actually the full record of the zero party. So you know what the person wants before they're buying it. So it's pre-purchase and pre-intent. And then you can utilize all this into whatever system you see fit. So you can send it over to Clavio, you can send it over to Dot, you can send it over to Amasis. And the, the results off the back of these are just astronomical. So you can really see how this ties into a world that is not reliant on third party cookies, is not reliant on um, you know, Apple changing privacy or Google changing privacy. This is your own information you've got via your own sources to your own customers. It goes back to people don't want to be sold. They want to buy. Yeah. And that goes good experience. And the lifetime value thing you mentioned, by the way, Michael, I, I started thinking about that. And I know that was a little bit back, but, but it really comes down to, I mean, we all go have favorite restaurants we go to. Well, why? Probably the food's good, but in a lot of instances, the service was just outstanding. You know, we went to a restaurant the other night. The guy, I love the waiter. I mean, love. It. I'm going to go back. I mean, the food was good, but I love the waiter, right? And so. Yep. It's the same, Let whatever we do in person that's good, we need to do it online. And that yeah. will increase lifetime value. Yeah, that's and I think, of, yeah. yeah. And we often think that we can, I think we often think that we can like cheat our way into giving that service. Like, um, you know, let's put some, like obviously there are tools that are great, but obviously there is some work just required to build the journeys, build the systems up to allow, but the ultimate results are you increase conversion rate by 
you're doing a hundred million a year. It's 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 a lot of it's a lot of return. It's a lot of money, and it's worth it. There's a reason why you know Best Buy hires ten thousand sales assistants um, to sit in all their stores because they know it's it returns. So moving into a case study very quickly, we work with a brand called Hair House. Obviously, they do all kinds of hair and beauty products. Now, they have 5,000 products. And for them, it was all about how do we navigate 5,000 products online, but then how do we capture that information for retargeting post that? So, you know, quite very quickly, um, we, they use Clavio. We're capturing the emails. We're capturing their the customers' journeys for... Um, it was like appliances, like hair straighteners, curlers, shampoos, and some treatments. And at the end, they provided a 10% discount if you provided your email. And these were the results we saw in Clavio. And they're just, they're just out, out, like astronomical. It's outstanding. They almost doubled their revenue through the journeys and the workflows in Clavio that actually were sourced by Prezi emails. The click-through rates were just incredible. Um, the conversion rates on the clicks over time were four times higher. They were getting higher AOVs. Generally speaking, it just showed an, an incredible experience that did end up providing um, short-term value. But even better than that is the longer-term value they will get from these customers knowing what they know. I love these results. Yeah, they were, they were, they were great. But not uncommon with our email capture. It's yeah. it is an outstanding, outstanding product. So you know, in the last couple of minutes, I thought I'd kind of close it out with. Um, obviously, there is on site. There is um, providing that guided selling on site. The bundling. Um, there is capturing the email. But you know, we we shouldn't obviously forget like checkout and post checkout. So this is more talking about the psychology because a lot of what we do, money is, is wrapped around psychology. It's wrapped around, you know, um, the psychological principles. So like, you know, for us, it's like bringing in-store shopping online. Um, it's about having like delayed um, gratification and having perceived effort when you're looking at these things. We found there was a lot in the checkout. So, you know, a, a simple example is just looking at like things like the power of free. So for example, um, we've we've done a bunch of surveys in um, America and, and, and Australia. In America specifically, we found that 71% of Americans found it appealing to actually receive offers and incentives, um, preferably towards the end of the checkout. So you'll see upsells, but actually at checkout or post-checkout, you'll see like cross-reference referrals, which we do, um, as well as you'll see like the power of free. So very simply put, let's say shipping is... $10 on a product. If you say, hey, buy this product for 50 or 60 and get $10 off versus buy this product for 50 or 60 and get free shipping, we all we all know the free shipping is going to work significantly better. So the point here is just not to forget um, the actual checkout experience. Don't make it overwhelming, but your sale's not done until it's done. So you need to reiterate the things. You need to reiterate the free shipping or you need to reiterate the 10% off or you need to reiterate the 15% the off for the bundle in the checkout if you can um, to really get them over the line. All right. And the last, the last lucky last slide of the, um, of the day is post-checkout. So we've discussed on-site, we've discussed checkout, but we've been experimenting money quite a lot with post-checkout and the results we're seeing are, 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 are pretty good. So we've built for context a, a program called NextBuy. The idea is that brands that are non-compete actually cross-reference post-checkout. So you go on to Ulta Beauty and you buy some NARS blush. Post-checkout, after the checkout's done, you actually cross-reference and you see an offer from Lululemon for some... Um, athleisure and we initially built this um, off the back that we did some we did some research and found that you know he says there 74 percent of, of shoppers um, found it um, pleasantly unexpected to receive something post checkout because once you check out you know you're mentally out of the game 
if you buy something online post checkout you have kind of you've assumed you're done so what we've found is once you actually do this the satisfaction of the customer goes through the roof after because they 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 know that it's not just a sell game thank you for your order thank you for the credit card details here's your tracking it actually goes beyond that and you start to create this brand loyalty and this brand loop if you will money that allows um allows you to create a community where you actually feel valued because you're actually getting something from a brand that's not that individual brand so it starts to feel very um it, it's disconnected from the brand so it feels trusted yeah so I will tell you when you mentioned this the other day I I, I was floored by the concept it was not one I thought of or heard of and I thought Oh my God, that is uh, that is actually brilliant. Okay, because now you've got brands working together. You've got your 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 going to whatever the original website is. They're going to feel good about you know. Oh my God, these guys are recommending other people. They care about me. Uh, then there's the back and forth between the different brands. Uh, 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 so yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, this yeah. is brilliant. Right. So I think um, without um, going into too much detail, I think that that summarizes the the session money. So happy to open it up to the to the audience if there's any questions. Great. So um, we've had some questions, but um, uh, uh, I will tell you that uh, I pretty much answered most of those. But if but if if you all got uh, uh, if you've got more questions, please uh, please go ahead and add them, add them in. So, and I'm also just answering more uh, to implement. So I will tell you, uh, uh, if I go back to my question, I would answer. Um, you've, I've watched you uh, behind the scenes, what this does and the complexity for what you do that you've made easy for for clients uh the idea of the feeds that you bring in and all of that because you got a client with 500 products for sake of our 5000 products you know if they were to try to build this by themselves you know i can't imagine what that would be but you're taking those feeds you're you're adding in some intelligence to it and making it easy to actually implement this so could you talk about how using your technology and the implementation process is streamlined yeah, I think in, in in a simple way, it's it's almost like looking at like, should I buy Shopify, Big Commerce, Magento, or build my own CMS? Um, like we all be, we work with Dell out of um, the head office in Texas, Guitar Center, Puma, Kmart, Adidas, a lot of the big guys. And generally speaking, the idea is we obviously need to get data. We need to clean that data. We need to build rules. Then you need to build Q&A that's responsive. You need to make sure the design's right. You need to make sure the security is okay. You need to be, be able to build complicated rules that says, hey, if someone answers this and selects that and they contradict, what do I do? What products do I show? So ultimately, once you get into the, the nuts and bolts of it, even the biggest companies in the world like Dell, um, like Puma, like Adidas, they just there's just no interest to build this because... They do have tech teams, of course, but their tech teams are better off spent implementing tools um, and ensuring that they've got, you know, compliance and security down pat than building, say, for example, a quiz that they now need to have to hire two or three developers or four developers full time to maintain, nurture. And then that doesn't even include any of the reporting. Yeah. How do you get reporting and things change and be adapted? So once you dig into it, it's kind of like, you know, um, why not build a content management system? It's like, I'm not in the game of building that. I'm in the game of, you know, selling athleisure or selling laptops and I'll focus there. Right. And then the, 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 the other side to that from an agency standpoint is, is because they've built these amazing tools, it makes it a lot easier for us to say, here's where we'd like this tool to pop up. Here's what we'd like it to say. Here's the, the, some of the verbiage we'd use. And so, you know, we add in that, that that marketing above and beyond. So Prezi is already doing an amazing job and they figured out how to make all of these things work. And then it's, it's your job along with Prezi or with ourselves 
to figure out how do we take that to the next level to make it even more persuasive, right? And and we've seen some amazing, amazing, amazing results by uh, by using Prezi. So I would strongly recommend you guys, if you're looking to increase your conversion rates on on your site that you reach out to uh, to Breezy. Their email address is, is on the on the screen. Their website is on the screen. Um, they they may have started in Australia, but they are very much becoming um, an American company too. Uh, they've got staff here now, and uh, and they actually spell personalized correctly now without an S. And uh, <laughs> they use the Z, so we can count on them to do the American stuff. Yeah, definitely. Michael, any last yes. thoughts do you want to add here? Uh, no, no. I think um, Marty really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me, and um, yeah, it's been it's been a blast. So, well, I want to thank you again. I want to thank all of you to come who came today, and uh, we will send out the recording. And we look forward to seeing you on a, a future one. And if you need help or have questions about Prezi, uh, Michael and company would be more than happy to answer, as would I. So, with that, thank you all for your time. Have a great rest of the day. Bye now. Thank you, everyone. Bye.